whenever we start assuming that we know people and what they've been through or we dismiss whatever they experience, I think that's where we start going wrong as a society, even as human beings. But the most important thing is be able to take the time to understand and listen to people, man, find out where they're coming from. And the, one of the things what I like to say is like, find out where people have been, where they're going, and the purpose they have in their life. And then you're gonna be able to connect. So sometimes you have to be humbly honest with, with, with our youth and let them know. And then especially so if you've gone through some experiences yourself, whenever you're able to tell them, hey, listen, I have the lived experience, I have the lived expertise of doing those things that you're doing right now. And I want to tell you that it's not good. They're gonna listen to you. Uh, they, you know, they're gonna sit there and say, I understand and I'm gonna listen to you because you are doing and standing where you're sitting where I am sitting right now. And 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 rather than have somebody who went, learn how to go to school, learn how to facilitate, and, and they never been through anything in their life. You know, so the kids learn how to see through that. So I think being authentic and saying, I'm going to take the time to listen to you, but so you can listen to me, my story, so we can connect and you can make the right decision for your life. At the end of the day, I do believe that our youth, they're going to have to make decisions on their own. All right, guys, welcome back to a brand new episode of the Heart and Hustle podcast. Now, I'm sitting across this digital table right now from an amazing individual. Mr. Jay Martinez is a leader who is having such a huge impact on an organization, but not only the organization, but the community and the things that he is doing at Hope for Miami needed to be highlighted on this episode of the podcast. Today, we're going to be talking about what Hope for Miami is all about. We're going to talk about Mr. Jay Martinez's history, the experiences that he's come from, the importance of leadership. We're going to talk about the responsibility of impacting and influencing the next generation, but also leading by example. Mr. Jay Martinez, welcome to the show, man. Hey, brother. Appreciate it, man. That's a great introduction, man. And, and thank you. Thank you for those kind words. And uh, looking forward to telling the story of what we do here as an organization. And also, I, I have had the blessing to become you know, I'd be who I am today. If I had to say one question right now, it would be this. Describe the man who sits across from me, but do not include anything that is work-related. Who am I sitting across the table from? Ooh, that's tough, man. And preparing me for this one. Um, that pretty much, I, I think, is, is a man who, who has lived through experiences um, and today lives to minimize those experiences for his kids and for the people that he encounters in the community in a positive way um, and connect via stories the way that God has created each and every one of us to do. What about your experiences as a kid? Because the one thing that I recognize is every single experience that we've had in life is almost like a small paintbrush stroke on the masterpiece of the person who we are. So let's kind of go back to those original layers, if you will. And let's talk about the man and the foundation of who sits across from me. Awesome, brother. I, and, and I love that. I love that that artwork because I think we all are a work of art, right? And and, and our experiences is what paints us, what created us. Um, you know, I was born in Nicaragua. I'm a family, uh, came to the United States when I was close to turning seven years old, you know, and, and, and we crossed the board, uh, you know, so it was one of those things is that you come into freedom and and some people don't make it past that point. You know, so to be able to get here and and live in in a house with your uncles and your aunts and your grandma and everybody is like a house of eleven people that was not meant to house that many people and sleeping on top of each other for years. Um and going through the let's say the the system, you know, the food stamps. Um, going, getting, getting the, 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 the free food at school, you know, being able to do that, like wearing the same clothes, like every week when you had to go, because back then they didn't have no uniforms, you rock like your polos and everything, everybody out of your shoes and you wear the same stuff over and over and over. Um, it's just one of those things that, that when you grow up, you like, you don't want your kids to experience that. Um, you know, so my father was not around. Uh, and I had some uncles around, but they were wearing the previous role models. They were hard workers. You can't take that away from them. 
that what it is to be a man and that way you relate you relate to situations. I didn't have that there. Um, so my past experiences, you know, father, my father not being able to connect with them, I connect with my kids in every way possible. Um, I'm, I'm not at every sporting event. I'm at every awards. I'm at every teacher conference. Whatever it is, I'm there. I'm listening. I'm going to be supportive and be there for them. And even so, even more so now, like the man that I am today and like what I stated is like finding others and helping their experiences and connecting. That is something that was built in me as well. I, I'm a good listener. I love listening to people. Like, not necessarily I'm always going to have all the answers, but I love to hear people and their stories because I, I love to take the time to to read their stories. And I think that's what we need to do better as, as a community because uh, we're not always going to be able to understand or put ourselves in people's shoes or change their mind. But it's always good step forward to be able to sit back, man, just listen to them so you can at least get an understanding as to why they are the way that they are. Uh, so my childhood and everything that I've been through, um, I don't take my freedom, man, and for granted. Um, and my my freedom of speech, my, my freedom to share, my freedom to talk, my freedom to be able to do anything because I basically didn't have that. And making it past the border to white fields at the age of six, going to seven, that's, that's a big story to tell on its own. I mean, we, uh, we are shaped, right, by the experiences that we go through. And one of the biggest things that I think is really important for us to kind of harp on that you mentioned there is we have a responsibility to protect our children, as an example, from the experiences that we went through. You know, one of the things that I take incredibly serious, and I might have mentioned this in our previous conversation together, was the accountability to be the best version of ourselves that we possibly can as men in society today. Because guess what? There are people in your lineage that couldn't even imagine the opportunities that sit in front of you. The fact that me and you are sitting here across this digital table with each other and we're talking about your story is something that your grandfather, your great-grandfather could never understand. My great-grandfather was a sharecropper from Arkansas. My grandfather was born in the 30s and was discriminated against as a black man for being a man of color. My father was the first person to be an entrepreneur and take a chance on himself that gave me opportunities that I could never even imagine. And now I have the opportunity to continue to connect with leaders and men like you who sit across the table who have the exact same experiences. And I often think that the answer to a lot of the problems that we face in society today are simply solved by seeking to understand rather than judging others. And I feel like as everybody who can't see Mr. Martinez in across the street or across the table from me, he's nodding his head. So I want to know, why do you agree with that statement so much? Whew. Man, because I, I think we all have our 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 the thoughts and our perceptions, you know. And I think whenever we start assuming that we know people and what they've been through, or we dismiss whatever they experience, I think that's where we start going wrong as a society, even as human beings. Um, like you mentioned, your ancestors and even mine. Like even though we are we come from different places, the struggles have been there. And, and being to this point, we all have to go through our experiences to be where we're at. And even though we might have different views on things. We hear we're talking, we have similar things, and we say, hey, we need to be present. We want to build the best uh, future for our kids and all of that. Then the reality is, is that you and I, we could have some good discussions about things that we don't see eye to eye. But the most important thing is be able to take the time to understand and listen to people, man. Find out where they're coming from. And the, one of the things that I like to say is, like, find out where people have been, where they're going, and the purpose they have in their life. And then you're going to be able to connect. And they say, you know what? We might not be here, but we, I understand you, man, and I feel you, and 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 I see why you are the way that you are, why you think the way that you are, that, that, that you think. And I think that's the first step for moving forward to be able to just coexist in this uh, what we call world as human beings, and that's because uh, nobody is going to be perfect. Nobody's going to be. We're going to click and say, "Hey, this is my best friend," and we think alike. We do this, even though a lot of people say I have best friends. The reality is that. You just did a lot of the time just because of the way they make you feel. You know, I know that you've had some fundamental experiences. Um, I know that you served in the Air Force as well. So I want to talk a little bit about that time. And I want to give the audience an opportunity to understand how those experiences kind of shaped you to be the person who you are today. What lessons did you learn in that experience? Uh, I think from, from day one, man, as soon as you get a basic uh, in the Air Force, um, or even any of the branch of militaries. A lot of people 
my all my veterans, yes, I know you guys said the Air Force is the easiest one, but it's still kind of tough. Um, but when you go to basic training, you got people screaming at you. And in and, and your work, whatever you've been used to for so many years, um, is broken down and you basically made into into a family, into a group of people where you're all equal. Nobody's better than anybody. Y'all got the same haircut. You wearing the same uniform. You got the same boots. You sleep on the same beds. It's like everybody here is equal. And, and that's what I love is because they you take people from many parts of the United States that will never have the chance to be across from each other and be able to understand each other. And basically for those, back then it was like eight weeks, um, you become a family. And, and people from Miami... I'm being communicating, talking to somebody from North Dakota, and we're connecting, even though we never experienced the same type of weather. And we're sitting over here, and we're listening to each other, and you become a family. So for me, from day one, the, the Air Force taught me that, that you are going to be exposed in life to people that you will never come across, that just being able to say, we have the same goal, we have the same mission, and we're going to get there together. Um, and, and then from there, pretty much, the Air Force has set me up in my, in my path where they told me so many things, even though I had discipline because I was on the basketball team, I played basketball my whole life. I was a captain, you know, so I, I had that initiative. I, I, I could lead. I did all of that. The Air Force pretty much built me with a lot of the soft skills that I have now. Um, just being, having the discipline to wear a uniform and to look at the little details of, of the hospital corner on your bed, um, the strings that are hanging on the uniform and cut them off, like the, the shoe shine. You know, so for me, it was like those little things like, hey, take the time. If you do things right, even though it seems like you're not doing anything, but just buffering that shine with the cotton, and you're sitting there and you see a pop. It's like it took you a while to get there, but you made it to that point. Um, so the Air Force with the discipline, being able to pay attention to detail uh, and, and initiative. Uh, and I think there's a lot of other things that I could talk to you about or what we kind of like experienced there. They're going through, through, through that and then being an aerospace medical technician, um, which is kind of like a nurse, that's another thing, another aspect of responsibility as well because now you are not only taking care of people, but you have people whose lives depend on their actions and the things that you need to pay attention to. You know, when somebody's chest is rising and their, their breasts are over the, the limit or you are noticing blood pressure that's really high, you know, you have to look for all those things and, and relay that information with communication to the nurses, to the doctors, so they can find out the appropriate uh, treatment to take. So for me, it was really big uh, to be able to do all of that and now get to the point where when I had to get out of the Air Force and come back home um, and be a part of the civilian world, I was set up for what I was going to encounter because uh, I had all of that. And school cannot teach you that. Only life experiences do um, so, you know, I, I had that lived expertise of what we do um, as leaders through the Air Force. Uh, so I, I shout out to all my veterans, man, because we know that a lot of the times our military branches, they send us up uh, for things that we experienced out in the world. It's the life experiences that we have that set us up for bigger opportunities. You know, that's the one thing that I think a lot of people need to realize is there's a lot of there's a lot of onus that is put on the ability for you to go through school and everything like that. School wasn't for me. I wasn't great at school, but I did learn a ton of lessons from the life experiences and the other leaders and men who I was around who showed me how to get things done. Consistency, being honorable, talking about how I can communicate more effectively is a huge reason why I do this podcast, to be able to learn lessons from leaders like you who have come through different walks of life, but we all end up in the same place, which is pretty beautiful. You know, one of the things that as you sit across for everybody who's watching today, you can see Mr. Martinez has a hope for Miami shirt on. And I want to kind of talk about your journey within the organization, because I know you didn't start as CEO. So how did you start and how did you ascend through the organization? Ooh, um, you know, it, it's, it's one of those things that it happened by chance. Man. I, I, I really do believe that God had put me in the right place. I, I was looking for a job. You know, I wanted to be a coach, basketball. Like I mentioned, I played basketball. I felt that that was the way that I was going to make an impact. I mean, you teach them how to play ball the right way, not the way that they teach them nowadays, um, but also to to help me connect the, the sports to life and the decisions that we make. Um, so 
I got out of the Air Force. I started going back to school, physical education. I'm going to be a P coach. I'm going to go coach basketball. Uh, a couple of months down the line, I graduate. It's not happening. Uh, they can't find a job. I can't find a coaching job. Um, so there was another organization that was called Up To Us, Coaches Across America. Um, they had an initiative where they were taking veterans and putting them into underserved areas, community-based organizations, to teach them that, connect sports, life, and how they all connect and, and, and through experiences. So I did that for six months. I was in another organization, Touching Miami with Love, and uh, Wolf of Miami was one of the organizations that was participating. And one of my uh, partners that was here at Wolf of Miami, doing the same program, he told me, hey, they have a position for Project U-Turn. That's our teen pregnancy prevention program. They're looking for a health educator. I said, like, man, that's not me. I, I can't do that. Um, he kept coming back at me. He showed me a resume. So after four times that he asked me, I said, you know what? I'm going to do it. Uh, I submitted my resume. Um, I came in for the interview. Um, and pretty much they offered me like 30K, man, uh, you know, to, to do that. And that wasn't anything for a guy who was taking care of, of a family of five. Uh, you know, so 30K to leave what I was doing. I said, you know what, I'm going to take this leap of faith. And and I started with Project U-Turn, which is a health facilitator. I was going into the schools, um, going through mostly the physical education classes. So I was taking the kids out of physical education, playing basketball, football, kickball, whatever, to come and sit down in front of me so they can listen to me to tell them, hey, don't have sex. Mm-hmm. Yeah, don't do that. That's not good for you. <laughs> Uh, so they were not happy at all. But by the time that we were done, there was such a connection, um, you know, where they would see the positive changes and the positive impact of the choices and our consequences and what it leads to. So uh, I started making the connection. I was not coaching basketball like I wanted to, but I was coaching like hmm. with, with this youth. So from there on, um, you know, I became the program manager for, for that program. Um, started taking it to different places in Miami and not just where we were at down south. So uh, I expanded. And of course, like, you know, any organization is like, man, what's really happening with this guy? Like, why all of a sudden this program is, is getting more kids? Like, you know, the excitement and this and that. So they were like, let's see what he has. Um, they, they, the organization started really to see the skill sets that the Air Force had given me. You know, that I was not just coming off the street. I was just not a kid that graduated college. Like, I had the lived, lived expertise of being in me, um, you know, that the school doesn't teach. So I started applying a lot of those things. Um, I started wearing the multiple ads as a CEO of a nonprofit, even as a program manager. I, I was helping out with IT. I was helping out with maintenance. I was helping out wherever they needed me. I'm like, yeah, I, I'll put that hat on. I'll do what I need to do. So... Whenever they saw that, there was another program that needed help. It was like, hey, you want to beat this program where you caught the ball and go try to fix this one that's all messed up? I said, I don't know if I want to do that. I'm comfortable where I'm at, you know? <laughs> but they were like, you know, we could really use your assistance. And, and at that point, what I started to see is like, okay, you know what? Um, what God has put in front of you right now is he wants to bless you with a whole lot more. And and I started taking that. I said, you know what? I'm going to go ahead and use what I've been doing. It's really not rocket science. Man. It's just taking the time to, to to see the people in front of you, see what you have, and make the best decision that we can make. Uh, so I did that with that program. It turned around. Um, everything started to align the way it needed to align. And then the pandemic hit, and the the founders were like, hey, we're going to move to North Carolina. <laughs> I said, great. So they're like, you stay back. And you run some of this, so they made me the VP. Um, you know, so I was like, kind of just follow along. And once again, I was like, you know what? I need to get what I need to get out of this. The same thing I did with the Air Force and the lived expertise. I took it, and pretty much from there, I just started to to make decisions during the pandemic. And a lot of that was like, hey, we don't need to jump into decisions. Let's see what we have, gather that information and make an informed decision that's best for our organization and that's best for our community. Um, and pretty much, I just kept my why in front of me. Why am I here? Why am I doing what I'm doing? Even though I'm moving from different positions and different roles with different now, with different, um, uh, uh, how do I put it, experiences, but also influence, right? Like I, I could say something and people can be like, oh, that's the CEO and I'm going to do it because he's doing it. Oh, he's saying it. 
that pretty much is like understanding that that what I said had weight now. You know, but if it was just the same things like my why, I'm here because I want to serve. And I want to serve our community. I want to serve our staff. I want to serve our kids and our youth, our families in the way that we want to serve. So that has that me from back then as a health facilitator to now to where I am, um, you know, leading uh, an organization that serves over 6,000 families with different programs. Uh, for me, it's just an amazing ride. Um, and, and I'm looking forward to it because at the age of 25, what were we doing? We were still learning. You know, yeah. so even with this organization at the age of 25, it's, it's a young organization. We still learn. And there's so much more that we will do um, just based off of our experiences and, and what we're doing as a, as, as a whole. And, yeah. Man, a, a true sign of winners is thinking about not just the instant gratification of the wins today, but thinking about how we sustain the impact that we're having. And when you think about the impact of serving 6,000 families, in your area annually. Think about the impact that you guys are gonna have in another 25 years. You know what I mean? It's like, think about the way of you being a health facilitator and pulling kids out of gym class. Now you're pulling people out of bad opportunities and you're giving them a platform so they can be successful. And one of the things that I love is you are not just doing what you're paid for, but you're doing what's gonna have the biggest impact and that has created so many opportunities for you. Can you kind of give me a little bit of a word of advice, if you will, for everybody who's a little bit younger in their journey today, who has an attitude maybe of, I'm not going to do more than what I'm assigned. I'm not going to do more than what I'm paid to be doing right now. And how that might be a little bit of a, let's call it a narrow sighted mindset for the opportunities that you can create for yourself in the future. Yeah. Um, you know, I think we talked about this the other day, uh, not so much of the narrow sighted cause you basically just looking at what's in front of you. Right. And, and, it, and I take it as a CEO, like, you know, I have to work, on the organization and not in. And, and I think at times you do have to work in. And when you're working in, you have to head down. Um, so if I'm talking to somebody who's younger, you know, I'm like, you, yeah, you're working in what you want to do in yourself and this and that, but you also have to work on. And when you're working on you, you're working on your resume, you're working on your skill sets, you have to look past what you have in front of you. What does that mean is that your thirst for knowledge needs to be there. You have to be curious about everything that happens around you. Like, you know, I said, why is it happening? Why is this done? Um, I was even just talking to my daughter the other day, like we were driving, she's learning how to drive. And and I was like, girl, like you're asking me all these questions. Do you pay attention whenever you're in the passenger seat? You no, know, because your head's on the phone. You should be asking, hey, why did you stop? Why did you do that? Why did you do that? So you have an idea, right? Because you're going to get behind the wheel. You're going to have to make decisions that sometimes can impact not just your life, but other people's lives. This, this, is, this is a dangerous thing that you're jumping into. So for me, that's what I, I tell people is be curious. The moment that you stop being curious, the moment that you stop seeking knowledge, that's the moment that you stop advancing. Like even us, like where we're at now, I'm sure you're still trying to, you know, your, your skill sets or how you do your job or, or even your work. Because I believe that what you're doing is not just a job. It's this work because you put in their work, allowing other people to come and talk about what they do to inspire others. It's not a job. Once you make that transition from job to work, it becomes fun. It becomes it's something that you look forward to going to, to do. And I think that's what I have found too. It's like, this, this is not a job, man. Um, it's work. And, and I, I'm thirst. I thirst for knowledge. I thirst for more to, to make my, my work easier, um, to inspire others, to talk to others. And it's not just motivation. Motivation dies out. And I, and I love people who motivate and do that. But when you inspire somebody to do something, that inspiration mostly lives inside of them. Um, so, you know, I want to inspire everybody to, to thirst for knowledge. And, and it's not just the book knowledge. It's not the school knowledge. It's that knowledge of hard knocks, man, what life has taught you, what you go through, the way it kicks you, beats you down, stand back up from it and learn from it. Because that's what life is all about. It's what happens to us and how we react and what we get from it. Not everybody's as lucky as we are, though, my friend. You know, it's uh, it's sad because I see a lot of people in my personal life who have jobs, right, that haven't made the transition to the work that they love. And they always say, like, hey, man, my job is just a way in which I can earn enough money so I can live my life. But when I think about the energy that you have in this body that sits in front of me and in front of you, you only have so much time in the day. 
You only have so much passion. You only have so much creativity. You only have so much charisma, so much imagination. And you should be able to pour those things into things that you are truly passionate about. Because if you're not, you're going to look back one day and regret the time that you spent just grinding away, doing the work that you weren't inspired by. And so I always try and challenge people to say the work that you do is not just just be about a paycheck. And that's important. I agree. But if you can find that magical intersection of finding what you're passionate about, so you don't need to take a day off, that is a beautiful place to live in. Because they always say, you know, if you are, if you love what you do, you never work a day in your life. I didn't really believe that until I really found my groove of being able to talk to people like you. I'd love to sit down like this because it creates so many opportunities for me to be able to share stories and to get jacked up by you who's sitting across the table from me because you're preaching the truth. And this is the type of example that I feel like our next generation of leaders and young influencers, the people when I'm not saying an influencer in the terms of Instagram and TikTok, but the people who are going to have influence over their friends to make better decisions, to spend their time more wisely, to invest into things that they truly can be passionate about. That is a way in which we can lift up our community and lift up each other at the same time. Part of our conversation, Mr. Martinez, is the shared responsibility to uplift the next generation. I want you to talk about how we can't do this individually, but there's a whole responsibility of everybody to come together to be able to set a proper example for the people who are coming up behind us. What does that mean to you? Brother, um, you know, I, I really do believe in this day and age, um, even more so our kids are so influenced about what they see um, with, with the phones, with the internet and social media and all the different platforms that are out there. Um, and you know, and the thing is, I was talking to one of the guys I play basketball with, and we were talking about it the other day. It's like, you know what? Our kids, they can make a decision. They can say, this is what I think. And they can go find some information to support their decision or support whatever they saw. And that's what mm -hmm. the internet has done for us. It's like back then, you had to run to the encyclopedia and go through the stuff. And that's how you find the information to support. That's that's your references that you use for any type of report. But now it's like you can find it anywhere, man. And I think it's even more so where we need to step up. Those individuals like 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 with what you're doing right now, or even what we do here, is hey, how do we get in front of our kids, of our youth, and talk to them and say, that what you it's okay, you're entitled to your opinion. Everybody's entitled, but here's the right thing. Right? And it's not always it might work out once for that person, whatever they saw, but for everybody else it doesn't work out that way. And and that's the thing is that you don't want to base off your decisions of what you saw happen positive one time when majority of the time it says if you get behind a wheel while you drop, you're going to get into an accident, right? So sometimes you have to be humbly honest with, with, with our youth and let them know. And then especially so if you've gone through some experiences yourself, whenever you're able to tell them, hey, listen, I have the lived experience, I have the lived expertise of doing those things that you're doing right now, and I want to tell you that it's not good. They're going to listen to you. Uh, they, you know, they're going to sit there and say, I understand, and I'm going to listen to you because you are doing and standing where you're sitting where I am sitting right now. And 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 rather than have somebody who went, learn how to go to school, learn how to facilitate, and, and they never been through anything in their life. You know, so the kids learn how to see through that. So I think being authentic and saying, I'm going to take the time, to listen to you, but so you can listen to me and my story so we can connect and you can make the right decision for your life. At the end of the day, I do believe that our youth, they're going to have to make decisions on their own. And all we can do is prepare them for life. Um, I, I have three kids with, with my wife and, and they're amazing. Uh, 23, uh, 19, and, and 17. Um, mm -hmm. But once they get to 18 and they are, they can vote. <laughs> They can do whatever they like man, at the end of the day because I'm not going to be there 24 7 following them and say, don't do that, don't do that, don't do that. You just have to trust that you've done the right things. And that's what we're doing as an organization is allowing those in, those individuals, those kids to be able to do that. So, our mentorship opportunities, what we have here all from Miami as well, is that it's like, how do we mentor others so they can also be mentors in those lives of the kids that they encounter each day? So, I think we have the obligation to take the time, not just to read stories and listen to stories, but to tell our stories as well. Because that's what connects us, like I stated before, and that's what they're going to trust. It's your lived expertise above the expertise that they get from books. I was listening to a podcast the other day 
And this guest was talking about the challenges of being a father. And he said, something that you don't know is that there is a protective instance that we have instinctually. When you turn 9, 10, 11, 12 years old, you start not listening to your parents. You don't think that they know everything, so you don't really take their lived experience and expertise at face value. Now, what this is, for everybody who's listening to and tuned in for the podcast, this is a, a scientific prevention that happens in our instinctual DNA to stop inbreeding. Now, this sounds crazy, but so when you were coming from a different place, Africa, wherever your people are from, way back in the day, thousands of years ago, when you started growing up, you would have to leave the tribe, right? And this is why parents often find out that their kids will listen to other adults and they won't listen to you. So you'll tell them, don't touch the stove, and they'll do it anyway. But if somebody else's dad or mom says, don't touch the stove, they're like, okay, I'm going to listen to that. That is an instinctual response to make sure that they go explore and they don't stay with their parents their entire life. And so I only use that reference to say that the community that we surround our children with, with other adults who have lived experience, are so much more important than you could ever imagine. And it's not just that your kids are trying to be stubborn, they don't want to listen to mom and dad, but there's a piece of our DNA that says, I shouldn't be listening to these guys. I should go out into the world and find different examples of authority. Now, that is something that I feel like is so beautiful, but it kind of ties a little bit of science into why this community element is so important. And organizations like yours are so important to show how we can lead by example and why other children and people, young people in our community are going to listen to us. Isn't that crazy? Yeah, man, it's crazy. I love it too, man. And I, I feel it in basketball too, man. I, my son, I will sit there, I'll coach him at home, tell him everything, man, you should do it, you should do that, you should do that. Never do it. Never. Nope. <laughs> Now, another person comes in and, and that probably has less experience playing than me, can't even shoot like me, and he listens yep. to him. He's like, what? Like, come on, man. Yep. Yeah, it's true. It's true, man. It's true. It hurts. It hurts as a parent. But but that community is so important. And 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 that's why I love our logo. It's a little mm -hmm. threads because that's what it takes. It's a community from different experiences, different resources, different values, everybody coming together and just supporting the community in the best way we know how. And that is sometimes just using our gifts, our experiences, whatever that we have that comes in and, and supports that community. I want to take the focus off of the younger lives that we're impacting and building the team around you. So I know that in order for you to have the biggest impact that you possibly can, you have to cast a vision so large that other people can find themselves and their vision within yours. And when it comes to serving the community, no more important obligation. So how are you thinking about leveraging your personal expertise and experiences to be able to excite the next generation of leaders that are going to come into Hope for Miami? How are you kind of thinking about that? Man, I'm going to be 100% kind of like transparent with you, man. Today I had a tough conversation um, with with, uh, with the staff that, that kind of like told me that what I was, I wasn't walking the talk. Man, oof. That 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 hurts, um, but it's something I think as a leader you have to be able to bring that out from people that they feel comfortable that they're going to share that with you and say, "Hey, listen, I respect you and this and that, but what you're saying is not really aligning or it's not really going where it needs to go for me." That is a person that's showing leadership, right? Because as far as leadership, you got to be able to communicate, you got to be able to talk, you got to be able to inspire. So for me, building those soft skills. In our, in our middle management, which, like I said, school doesn't teach us that much anymore about that. Um, you go through the books, you go through the things. And even I went to an internship. I didn't learn anything from my internship when I was graduating college. Like, pretty much I was just there to get my hours and go. Uh, so you don't really get a lot. So being able to to take that here and invest in our middle managers, because um, they are the ones, kind of like in the Air Force, it was the enlisted force. Right, the enlisted members did a lot of the work. The other ones, we were just kind of like helping out, leading, taking obstacles out of the way. That's what we do here. Is the middle managers are the ones that are in and out of the community, doing what they need to do, and and all we can do is just take out those obstacles from them. But I think as as leaders, we have to listen to them. We have to take the time to read their stories and and see how we are supporting them. Because that's who's going to be running organizations in the future. We have a saying here a, that our founders used to say, I ever wrong that you're here. We're going to pour it into you so you can grow and grow. And if it's here 
in, in the same organization or another position or for another organization. We want to be able to say that you left here better than you can. Um, and you're more prepared to lead others. Because at the end of the day, our organizations and what we do doesn't make us. Uh, I, I love what I do, but I'm going to be Mr. J, whether I'm here or I'm somewhere else. Um, you know, I'm going to have the same passion. Whether I'm go ahead and hitting a nail with a hammer, I'm going to have the same passion as I as I am talking to somebody about what we do as an organization. It's going to be there because I love what I do, uh, whether it be that or, or this. Um, but I think what we have to do as leaders is to say, you know what, I'm okay with passing on what I have to you. And I'm not afraid of you becoming better than me. Because at the end of the day, that's the, the, the biggest accomplishment for me is to see somebody who surpassed me um, in what I what I was good at. Uh, so I'm bas- basically, it's kind of like, you know, the teacher becoming the steward because then I've been learning from you and how you are taking it to another level. So the same thing with our kids. That's what we hope to see, man, is that they do better than what we did. And and I think as a community and as leaders, that's what I would like to see is that our leaders are better than what we came in as. Because that's what I would like to say is that I kind of took our leadership step up for my founders, even though I love them. Um, but I want for people to say, you know what, I want to do better than Mr. J. I want to be an organization better than Mr. J. Because that would be the the greatest uh, compliment that you can ever give me and say, I did better than that guy. Yeah, I mean, don't judge me by the results of the organization, but judge me by how much the team beneath me has grown, right? Because as leaders, we're supposed to put people on the same way that you feel about your kids. You know what I mean? I'm going to do things to protect you from the experiences that I had so you can do better than me. We stand amongst the shoulders of giants, right? And I feel like we have to take that, that adage and put it into our businesses as well. You know, Mr. J, I want to I want to give you an opportunity to kind of rub the crystal ball. Tell us what the next two to five years looks like at Hope for Miami. What are we trying to paint? What vision are we trying to fulfill? What's the impact that we're trying to have? Brother, um, I think, you know, for so many years, our organization has been humbly kind of like just doing the work um, without really, I don't want to say that you're patting, patting yourself on the back or, 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 you know, saying, hey, look at us, look at us. But I, I do believe that we accomplish more together. And I'm a big believer in that. Um, and I think for me and our organization is how do we bring other people, like when we stay, we are so blessed to be able to put in work in our jobs. But how do we bring others with their jobs and now allow them to put in work or they can't put in work? They come put in work with us. Like we have so much work here in our communities um, that you can come in and, and impact a child just by sitting down and doing some homework with them, you know, doing a project with them, going out there, taking a shot of, of, with a basketball or throwing a football with them, whatever it is, like you can make an impact and put in that work so you can get fulfilled. Because at the end of the day, our love tanks, man, our hearts, they're meant to to be spent and to be plenished. And, and I think for me as an organization, that's what I would like to envision is an organization where we're not only serving our community, but we have others that are coming alongside of us and with more intentionality there we are allowing them to to spend and replenish their love tanks in our communities, whether it be with their with their activities coming in day in, day out, or if they want to support us with resources, if you want to donate for a backpack, if you want to donate for a tow distribution, if you want to donate for, for a turkey giveaway, whatever it is. Don't need that. If you want to give us our restricted funding and say, hey, I want you guys to continue this program because if that grant leaves, this program is important to me because I, because if this is what I went through, and they do that. Whatever way possible, I want to open up the doors. And um, I love the transparency too. It's like I like to tell people, hey, listen, you don't feel comfortable? I don't feel comfortable. You can just give me any money. You don't connect with us. Right? To be honest, come over here. Like, come hang out with me. We got to go walk across the street, go see the kids. We're going to go ahead and talk to them, play with them, find out their stories, and connect. And then you can say, you know what? I know what they do. I felt what they do just by being there in their in their organization, in their in their building, in their parking lot. I know what Hope for Miami is all about. And what I want more than anything is to do that, but also to have champions of people that talk about Hope for Miami. So uh, that, that would be the Next two or five years is how do we get more people connected and how do we grow these threads 
across our communities that need it most. What we'd like to do as we kind of close our episode here is we have a question that came from our previous guest. Now, she wanted to ask a simple question. I think you're really going to vibe with this one. How are you intentionally growing the next generation of leaders in your organization? Intentionally. I think, I think it's that, man, it's taking the focus off of you. Um, and, and for so many years, even with me, like, you know, my, my upbringing, my history, uh, being, being a immigrant child myself, learning English as a second language. And even now I still pronounce some words that people are like, Hey, that's not where you pronounce it. It's like, well, I wasn't born. Um, you know, so like I use that excuse, but it's like, you know, for so many years, you're fighting, you're fighting, you're fighting, you're fighting to prove people that you belong, that you fit in, that you're the right person for the job. And, and you are a high alert because you're like, no, no, nobody's going to take this away from me because you don't know where I came from. You don't know that growing up, I had to eat rice and ketchup. And then occasionally I throw the eggs in there to, to have that. That's what I ate every day of the week or that I had to do a syrup sandwich with some syrup and some bread. And that was my, my sugar, you know? So it's like, <laughs> you don't know that, but I think it's taking the focus off for of you and saying, you know what? I made it. I've been blessed to this point where I can lead others. So intentionally taking the focus off of me and saying, I don't need to fight no more. I don't need to fight for myself. I don't need to fight for me to make it to this point. Yes, I want to continue to gain knowledge, but now I'm going to fight for myself. I'm going to fight for them. I'm going to fight for them to continue to have the opportunities that I had and possibly even more. I'm going to continue to fight for them to get the knowledge and to go professionally in a way, like I stated, that they surpass what we have done here as an organization um, and leaders and that they become better versions of us as leaders. And that can only mean great things because I, I would like to say that we've done some amazing things that hold from my hand. And if anybody can say, I got that from them and I'm doing better than them, I can't believe the work that they will be doing in the, in the communities and in the world uh, whenever we hold hands and we extend together because we will reach further. So intentionally, that's why I think I'm doing this. The focus is off Mr. J and more importantly, on the leaders of tomorrow. And that's why we really focus on the youth and people will say that one of the biggest things that I love to do here is highlight the voice of the youth because they are the future. And then we can teach them how to speak up at a younger age, especially about things that are not going the right way. We as adults are ready to listen to them. They just need to be able to speak and have a platform. So that's how I'll say intentionally we're, we're trying to do that. Mr. J, I just want to say for everybody who is watching and listening today, the fact that you are at the helm of Hope for Miami is an absolute blessing. And it's your lived expertise and your experiences that are going to take your generations that you're supporting to the next level, man. So I just want to say for everybody who's watching and listening, brother, thank you so much for everything that you're doing. I really appreciate it. Thanks, brother. Appreciate you, man. There we go, guys. That's a wrap. We'll catch you in the next one.